a little bit about me, of course. I'm Kenny Williams, as Marilyn just said. I'm a fourth year medical student here and uh, originally from Albany, New York. And um, disclaimer right up front, I am not a historian by training, right? So um, a lot of this is, is out of kind of passion project work, stuff that I've kind of read into and looked into um, and not necessarily like um, hardcore uh, research and, and background training. So uh, with that being said, and kind of in that vein, I'd like to welcome you to a little Black history here at Dartmouth. Um, I do want to start with uh, acknowledgments, again, thanking the DICE office, um, Black students at Tuck, Black students at Geisel. Um, huge shout out to Geisel SNMA. And of course, a special shout out to Marilyn. I wanted to start by just kind of talking a little bit about the why, like why am I, as I just said, I'm not a trained historian, a historian by training. Why am I talking about a little black history here at Dartmouth? Um, and I think that goes back about two years ago. Um, some of my fourth year classmates here might've seen a earlier iteration of this as um, it was February at the end of my second year, and uh, I was kind of waiting for something to happen, some acknowledgement, something from administration or uh, some programming, and kind of nothing came about. Uh, waited a little while longer, expecting to see something, and still nothing. And, and um, as time went on a little bit more, I was maybe even expecting, you know, kind of a, a little cheesy paragraph and an MLK quote or something. And still nothing. And, and so I was a Schweitzer fellow and was presenting to my fellow uh, um, Schweitzer fellows at the uh, our, our monthly meeting. And I decided, why don't I dig into this and kind of find and, and put together something that I felt like uh, would be representative of Black history, particularly here at Dartmouth, right? Something tangible that we could really connect with and feel like um, spoke to us in the, in the community writ large. And so that was kind of the first iteration of this project. Um, as I said, Marilyn reached out to me and asked me what I kind of upgrade it, update it and, and share it again. And again, I, I said, of course, gladly. Um, I think the broader why for me uh, stems also from a, a, just a few key things. And the first being that um, black history is American history, right? Like we, we look at it, and, and highlight it in February, but 12 months a year for the entirety of this country's history, um, it's inextricable. Those two things are inextricably tied. They are one and the same. And so I think it's extremely important to kind of shed light and understand the context in which um, Black bodies and Black voices have at, had and, or had not had access to certain spaces and how that access came about. Um, I think that's even more present today, you know, given the current climate and the things that we're seeing, you know, politically, socially. Um, I, I think that there's a big piece missing. We have a crisis kind of, of understanding. We're missing this, con this broader context. And I think that's rooted in this, in, in history, right? I think that's what history really brings to the table. Um, I think it's also important that we as a country have these very amazing ideals, um, right? The unique experiment that is America. And it's important to keep a contextual and historical um, understanding of this as we continue to measure our sense of ourselves against those ideals, right? We have no idea how close we are or how much we're fulfilling those ideals if we don't have a full scope of where we've been, where we are. Um, thus making it harder to kind of really be clear about where we're going. I also thought uh, it was important because I, I really wanted to show the interconnectedness, um, not just between the broader society and the Black community, not just the Black community here at Dartmouth, um, but really just showing the interworkings and interlacings, right? We, we talk about intersectionality when we talk about systemic racism or institutional violence. Um, but I think it's that same idea when we think about the broad breadth of history and how all of these things are inextricably linked. Um, and then lastly, for me, it was um, 
it's a passion because I really draw a lot of support and inspiration from a lot of the, these stories and, and history. Um, in times when I have felt, found trials or tribulations in my life, and you know, medical school is no different. Uh, I have really leaned on the stories, the life, the lives of some of these people I'm gonna highlight today as uh, for hope, for inspiration, for um, just shining examples of resilience and perseverance. Um, and so for me, I think that it was the broader why for how this whole thing kind of came about. And so I think it was, uh, just as I think history is important for the context, you know, for what we're talking about and what we're seeing in our everyday lives right now, I thought it was important to share with you the, the why, the context behind, again, why I'm even sitting in front of you and why I even uh, took a stab at creating this presentation and sharing kind of some of the things. Um, so with that, I kind of just, a real rough agenda would be, I hope to kind of share some stories with you. And I keep calling them stories. I'm highlighting some people's lives who have at one point or another, you know, touched our campus here at Dartmouth. Um, but I think their, their whole lives are kind of these wonderful mosaics of, of so many great, strong ideals that I think are directly tied to the black community and what I uh, kind of connect with when I talk about my blackness. Um, and so I wanted to share, again, just a few of these people that I highlighted for about 30 to 40 minutes. Then I want to open it up for a discussion. Um, you're going to hear me lecture at you for long enough to where I think hopefully some of these stories will trigger some things in you that, you know, you'd love to share or talk or discuss because I'd love to hear other voices other than mine. All right. And uh, with that being said, the last thing I want to make clear is that, uh, you know, often we say uh, in the Black community that we stand on the shoulders of giants. And I think this presentation um, in its content and and lens on history will, will show that to be the case. But uh, literally in the work that I'm presenting is, is also the case. And, and those giants that I am going to, that I have leaned on heavily for a lot of this information um, were, are these two that you see on the screen here. Um, Dr. Forrester Lee, who is uh, a Dartmouth graduate and is now currently a uh, professor of medicine at Yale and uh, Taylor Garbutt, uh, Dartmouth 16 alum. And um, she did her senior thesis project um, really looking at particularly black women's voices over the last about 40 years at Dartmouth College. and. Uh, her work was instrumental in kind of pulling out some of the stories that I will reference a little bit later as well. Um, but a huge thank you to, to these two. All right, and so to frame this out, I kind of started with this piece here. And um, this is the Crisis Magazine uh, from 1931. And for you, those of you who don't know, the crisis was the publication of the NAACP, of course, started by Du Bois and so many other kind of behemoths of the, of the Black community at that time. And uh, they were really, this issue was highlighting um, African Americans getting into higher education, right? Getting into even clearly so the the Ivy League institutions, but really just higher education in general, talking and navigating the lands, how the landscape had changed um, given this time. And I, I thought this was just an interesting quote and an interesting place to kind of start before we dive back. Um, and so Dartmouth as highlighted there was, uh, an article was done and the president at the time was uh, Ernest Hopkins. And uh, part of his article, uh, was this quote that you see before you hear. It says, uh, those Negro students whom we have had in a very large proportion of the cases have done extraordinarily well. I am not nevertheless convinced, except in the unusual case of the desirability of enrollment of Negro students within the college. And so I thought that was such a powerful quote given the 1930s. And the reason why I chose that, like I said, was because it might not have been hard Dartmouth policy, but that was definitely the culture. And he clearly felt comfortable to put that in a, in a uh, publication that he knew was going uh, 
around predominantly to black people, but would be well read and well received. And so this was the culture in the 1930s, right? And so when, we're gonna start this conversation um, over a hundred years before this. And some of the people that I'm gonna talk about are gonna have navigated this landscape that he's referencing almost a hundred years before this. And so I just thought that that was such a powerful kind of insight to see that when we think about these things over time, uh, it, 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 we sometimes in, in the simplification of it, let things seem so much quicker and so much pro more progressive um, than they actually were, right? And so to, to kind of start, I just wanted to start kind of right here at the beginning uh, with Reverend Eliezer Wheelock. Um, should sound extremely familiar to everyone uh, as the main thoroughfare through Hanover is named after him, you know, buildings, et cetera. And uh, he was born in 1711 and died in 1779. And he actually comes from a pretty interesting lineage of um, pretty prestigious educators and um, religious uh, figures. Uh, but he himself, again, along with his family were farmers at the time and he grows up and he ends up going to Yale and, um, like a lot of people who are obtaining their education, uh, he studied theology and came out and becomes a reverend and a pastor of a church in Lebanon, Connecticut. Uh, and he's there for about 30 to 35 years. Um, during this time though, he becomes like a really fervent leader in the Great Awakening. And so uh, just for reference, the Great Awakening of course was that kind of spiritual revival movement that we saw uh, during that time. It was occurring in England as well, but it was spread to, of course, the 13 colonies. And it was really about this new birth, this idea that when you kind of found Christ or, or when you had this uh, coming to moment that it should have really uh, imbued you with a passion around this religion, right? So you start to see people preaching in the streets and you kind of, they want you to feel it in your heart. And uh, so this new form of evangelism, right, uh, comes with this idea of, again, this new birth, this new view, this new approach to practicing Christianity or practicing your religion. And it also has this other arm, which is this emphasis on conversion, this emphasis on reaching out to the masses and bringing others, leading others to the calling. And of course, the predominant people that, uh, a lot of missionaries were reaching out to and engaging with were Blacks and Native Americans. And Wheelock would be no different. Just a point of clarity here, um, they were welcoming and engaging African Americans or, or Blacks and Native Americans. Um, and they were really pitching this idea of spiritual equality, but they still did not see these people as equals, right? There was this idea that there's this spiritual equality, this idea that our spirits are kindred and equal under the eyes of God, but we are not in, in ourself equal in this society. And I think that's super important to understand, not just about Wheelock, but about just the broader uh, movement. Um, and so he also, he takes on a student uh, by the name of Samson Occam, and this becomes his first student. And now Samson is a, uh, a Native American, he's Mohegan, who uh, learned English at a young age. And so he works with Wheelock and Wheelock teaches him about theology and teaches him uh, how to read Latin and um, teaches him all of these skills and kind of helps to grow and develop him again under the great prophetic tradition of becoming a, a pastor or a preacher. So after about four or five years, uh, Samson becomes a preacher. He actually moves to Long Montauk, Long Island and um, organizes Native Americans there and helps them lead them to Christianity and creates these enclaves, uh, kind of creates his own actually Christian school for Native Americans as well. And so he becomes for not just Wheelock, but I think the Wheelock's donor base, this idea that Natives, Blacks, others could be converted. And one means of that is also through the means of having a school. If you have an institution, you can kind of teach them to read the right and write kind of the worldly skills. And you can also teach them the otherworldly, the above 
worldly traits. And um, so uh, it, it inspired Wheelock to start what he calls the Moore's Charity School. Um, and he starts that actually in Connecticut. And so it, through that school, he educates uh, about two or three different black men who come through there. One Caleb Watts and other Prince Saunders who um, go on to engage in a lot of work in Haiti and, and, and throughout the South. Um, but this kind of builds for him this idea that he needs to broaden and expand the school. Um, so he started to reach out to donors and figure out a way to do this. Again, he wants to interact with Native Americans and realizes Connecticut is kind of hard to do that. He needs to be closer. So he obtains a charter and moves to a place called Hanover, New, Am New Hampshire and starts uh, this school. And one of his major contributors at the time was um, back in England, he was the Lord of Dartmouth and hence, he took his money and gave him the name. Ironically enough, the Lord of Darkness was very uh, um, opposed to this expansion. He was not happy about this idea that uh, Wheelock would be educating Native Americans and, and Blacks. And interestingly enough, as we see, the first graduating classes that come out of the expanded Moore's Charity School, which again becomes what we know as Dartmouth College in 1769, um, are actually not Blacks and Natives, um, but are actually just the children of colonists, right? So his son is actually in the first graduating class, uh, John Wheelock. Um, and of course, Eliezer Wheelock becomes the first president and his son actually becomes the second president. Um, and I thought it was a key point to just remember, as I was saying, when, it, when we talk about the spiritual equality and not actual equality, um, this time Wheelock was a slave holder. He had slaves, he brought slaves with him up to Hanover, New Hampshire to, to do the work of, you know, erecting buildings and setting things up and doing labor. All of that was done by slaves. So, you know, he has this, uh, this interesting dissonance in his, in his story that we see time and time again uh, throughout history, especially when it comes uh, with uh, religious figures and equality and how that actually plays out. And so he sets up the school and um, years later, we, we would encounter this gentleman by the name of Edward Mitchell. Now, Edward Mitchell is born in Martinique and he wants to come to the US to find a better life, to find a spouse and to kind of uh, start new beginnings as, as a, a, a lot of people saw the new world, America as being that, that new start. And so while traveling, his ship is actually uh, really badly wrecked and destroyed. He's overboard, he falls overboard. He barely makes it to shore and survives. Um, but in this like near death experience, he's actually really drawn to, to, uh, to God. He, it makes him very closer to God. He becomes a devout Baptist and, and his spirituality becomes very important to him. He settles in, in Philadelphia and begins to work as a porter there uh, for a man by the name of Benjamin Gilman. Now it turns out Benjamin Gilman is the cousin of the wife of the president of Dartmouth at the time. Um, and that's important because the president of Dartmouth at the time is a man by the name of Francis Brown. And he was traveling in the South in, in around 1820 and uh, contracted TB and became extremely sick. So on their way moving back to New Hampshire, um, they stopped to rest in Philadelphia at his wife's cousin's home, which is Benjamin Gilman. And during this time, as, uh, President Brown's wife is kind of writing in letters that, you know, she expects uh, Francis Brown to die any day, any moment. He's definitely on his deathbed. And you see Benjamin Gilman writing letters to his son saying, hey, like, you know, my, my wife's cousin's here and her husband is, I mean, he's gonna die any minute. And so she, she was very concerned that she wouldn't be able to fully care for all of Francis Brown needs. And so she reaches out to Edward Mitchell, who again was the porter for Benjamin Gilman and, and uh, offers to hire him for a year and says, you know, we'll, we will hire you to help 
support our family for the next year. And so he agrees, he signs on and he travels with them back to Hanover. It's only about a month after they arrive back in Hanover that Francis Brown actually does die. Um, and Mitchell actually stays on and works with the family for several more years, I think upwards of three or four more years. During that time, he's learning how to read and write and, and develop all of these other academic skills. Um, having worked for the president of the college and, and having accumulated all of this knowledge, he wants to get a degree. So he turns to Dartmouth College and says, you know, this is where I'd like to come so I can obtain my degree. Uh, he applies to Dartmouth. Uh, he passes all the faculty entrance exams and by any other account should be cleared to start. Uh, but he is denied by the trustees. The trustees are in complete fear that the students will see this black man coming as a student and there will be total uprising, absolute chaos. So the tr trustees block his entrance. Um, in hearing about that, the students organize, get together and protest. And they actually send a letter to the trustees stating, and I quote, from what we know of Mr. Mitchell's moral character and intellectual attainment, we wish him every success. So far from feeling any disrespect towards him on account of his color or extraction, we think him entitled to the highest praise. And so immediately the trustees are in this weird situation because you have these students who are embracing Edward Mitchell and say, by all accounts, he has done everything required of any other student. He should be able to come here. And their biggest fear or what they kind of perpetuated as their fear um, was completely uh, misfounded. Uh, he is enrolled as a student and becomes the black the first black graduate of Dartmouth in 1828. And again, I just just to point out the crisis article that I showed you earlier was from 1931. So we're talking about 100 years prior to that article being posted, stated by the president of Dartmouth College, we have our first black graduate of Dartmouth. Um, he would go on, uh, Edward Mitchell would, after graduation, go on to uh, Becoming a missionary Baptist minister, he would move up north into Canada uh, in the Quebec area and would be considered by many of his contemporaries at the time uh, to be one of the most profound theologians of the area and uh, to this day is considered one of the, the most prolific theologians in the area. And so here we have the first black man kind of moving into a space, right? Obtaining a degree from an Ivy League institution in the, at eight, in the year 1828. To put that into context though, like the first black graduates of Ivy League colleges are all listed here um, from the earliest uh, to the latest. And you can see um, Dartmouth was the first at 1828 with Edward Mitchell. Uh, it'd be almost 50 years later in 1872 when Harvard would have its first graduate um, and so on and so forth down the list. Um, but interestingly enough, it wouldn't be till the 1940s that Princeton would have its first black graduate, right? So almost a hundred, over a hundred years later. And interestingly enough, at that time, Dartmouth at the time Princeton graduates its first black graduate, Dartmouth has graduated over a hundred by this point, right? On to the next uh, awesome character in, in history um, and a wonderful story that I think goes along with, with him as well. And that's Mr. Sam Ford McGill. Uh, those at the medical school might've heard his name uh, come up in conversations and or um, talks about uh, especially DEI work here and this is predominantly why he was an amazing person and a truly a pioneer. Uh, so he was born in 1815 and, and died in 1872 and he was born in Baltimore, Maryland. So he's true, he's an African-American, um, but at a really young age, his family moves to Liberia. Um, so his father who was a slave uh, and then became free 
um, was a teacher and a minister and was really well connected and, and, and good friends with a lot of people leading the movement, the liberation movement, like the black liberation movement, which was that um, freeborn slaves and newly freed slaves could never truly find freedom, happiness and equality in America. And so they founded uh, Liberia on the Western coast of Africa and were moving there to establish kind of a new settlement for black people where they could truly be free and truly be uh, happy. And so his father moves his whole family over to Liberia um, when he's a young boy um, and he grows up there and his father's prominent kind of in the political and um, education scene. Um, and so being the eldest son of, you know, a prestigious figure in the colony, he wants to pursue medicine and wants to get a degree uh, from the US. So he writes to um, a man by the name of uh, Mr. Shepard, who is a uh, abolitionist and supporter of the, the black liberation movement. And he says, this is what I want. I want to obtain a medical degree from the US. And uh, can you, can I count on your support? Can I count on your financial support to get there for books? Can I count on your support for helping me get into a medical school and navigating all of that? And he begins to help support Sam Ford McGill to do that. And eventually um, McGill is accepted to the Washington Medical College, which is in Baltimore, Maryland. So he, returns to Baltimore. Um, he isn't at Washington Medical College for about more than a month um, when the students organize, get together and draft a letter that they send to the trustees. And this letter um, is in protest of having Sam Ford McGill there. And just to give a small quote from the letter, any persons who possess any degree of self-esteem cannot conceive that the faculty would consent that students of fair complexion should mingle with those of dark skin. They go on to say, also, this boy has gone far beyond the limited space granted to him and has encroached as far upon the privilege enjoyed by the students as to wound their feeling and disgust them by his actions. And so, they did not want anything to do with Sam Ford McGill. They did not want him even, again, sitting in the same classrooms as him. And a lot of them would then also express this idea that if they graduated with him, then uh, they would be seen as equals of a black man, which would make it impossible for them to find any work after graduation. They would uh, almost, ultimately never be able to work in the South and it'd be still very difficult to work in the North. And so with that, the trustees expel Sam Ford McGill from the school. Um, but staying true to what he, he wanted he, and looking for ways to adapt and, and, and still obtain his goals, um, he works with Mr. Shepard and they are able to be connected. And he's then connected to a gentleman by the name of Dr. Edward Phelps. Now, Dr. Edward Phelps is a professor of anatomy and surgery um, here at, at University of Vermont. Um, and he agrees to take on Sam Ford McGill uh, to work as a private student in, in Windsor, Vermont, um, as an apprentice, but also to help him kind of attend lectures and hear and learn kind of formally uh, the, the knowledge needed to be a physician. And so Sam Ford McGill travels up. He actually travels up with these two cadavers that he's bringing for uh, Dr. Phelps's lab and begins his work there. And I think in the first couple months, um, Dr. Phelps writes that he's learned more in five months than you know uh, I would expect students to have learned in six or eight months. And so he's just absorbing all of this uh, information and, and uh, killing the game essentially. And it just so happens that Phelps has to resign from his, his position at UVM later that year. Um, and so he does that and kind of returns to his private practice in Windsor. Um, but he tells 
uh, McGill that, hey, like I will still issue you your accreditation as a physician, right? Like you've done the work, you've apprenticed under me, you have the skill and the knowledge. Uh, but McGill says to him, no, I, I want to go back to Liberia and practice medicine. In order to do that and be and do it with the credibility that I want, I need a degree. And so immediately Phelps and he begin to try and figure out how he can obtain that degree. Uh, Phelps ends up connecting with people that he knew and leveraging um, some of those networks and connections. And Sam Ford McGill is uh, admitted as a student to Dartmouth Med and ends up graduating uh, Dartmouth Medical School in 1839. And this makes him the first black graduate of not only Dartmouth Medical School, but of any US medical school in the country. Uh, at that time, he then, after saying his goodbyes, I think he goes to, back to Philadelphia for a short while, um, I'm sorry, Baltimore for a short while, and then he returns to Liberia. And upon returning there, he becomes the colony's uh, first black physician um, and also goes on to become uh, one of the key governors of the Maryland County, which is uh, you know, one of the parts of, the, of, of Liberia. Um, and then while there, he also goes on to train many, many other young black men uh, who he helps not only develop their skills and, and kind of learn the knowledge, but then uses his network back at Dartmouth. And so a lot of them go to Dartmouth and actually become graduates of Dartmouth Medical School as well. Um, some of the, again, first, in, when you look at the, the batch of kind of the first 20, 10, 20, um, black men to graduate from Dartmouth Medical School. These time and time again, you see people who kind of came up under Sam Ford McGill in Liberia. So we have now in 1839, a black man kind of really breaking down that door and then using that and leveraging that to help other black men from Liberia kind of get and obtain that degree. Um, I want to tell one quick story of a gentleman by the name of William Ellis. Uh, I think he's uh, super interesting and, and has a really interesting, again, thematic point uh, to his storyline here, but just really quick story for him in that he's born in 1834 and died in 1866. So he died pretty young. Um, he was born in New York City, an apprentice under a, a black physician there and then attended uh, Dartmouth Medical School and graduated in 1858. He would then move down to Philadelphia and start his own private practice. And um, he would be taking care of uh, black patients there in Philadelphia. And of course the civil war then erupts and kind of staying true to, I think what would we now know is kind of the, the uh, not the exception, but rather the a theme that we see in many wars he enlists to serve uh, on behalf of the Union, but specifically requests to work uh, with his colored brethren. He wants to be in a colored division. And so he serves um, in the Union Medical Corps uh, alongside other black troops. And when the war is done, he then moves back to DC uh, where he begins work at Freedman's Hospital. And for those of you that don't know, Freedman's Hospital in DC is um, it's an amazing place. It's the first public hospital for blacks in America and they were taking care of a lot of freed and men um, post-slavery. And uh, it was there that uh, he has this amazing kind of touch points with some key figures in history. One person he ends up engaging with, um, literally treating, healing, and then also befriending um, is a woman by the name of Harriet Tubman. Uh, she comes in and he is her physician and there's letters shared between them afterwards that shows that they, again, were good friends and communicated regularly. Uh, which I thought was super interesting and powerful. And he also um, ends up treating and befriending Sojourner Truth, who um, 
becomes accosted by a white train operator and needs medical attention. So she comes to Friedman's hospital where he takes care of her. And um, she would then go on to file a lawsuit against that, that train conductor. And he would actually testify in court on her behalf. And so he has this, this amazing story where he kind of engages with some of these behemoths that we think of, these truly powerful black women uh, in black history. And so I, I thought his story was, was awesome. Unfortunately, he did die of typhoid fever at a, at a pretty young age while uh, treating uh, many recently freed slaves in DC. And so now I kind of just want to leap forward a little leapfrog up to um, the class of 1978. And I uh, kind of labeled the entire class, but uh, just for reference, Dartmouth didn't start accepting women until 1972. Um, and so it clearly is not that long ago, but even then it still took until 1974 when we got the first seven black women admitted in, in that class. Um, two of them who, again, thanks to Taylor Garbutt's uh, wonderful senior thesis, uh, were able to share a little bit of their story and kind of journey uh, through Dartmouth at that time. And so I, I thought to kind of just highlight a little story from them too, I think would really uh, kind of speak to their relationship and, and kind of give some insight in that time. Um, so Ricky Fairley, who is second to the left at the top here, and Victoria Stewart, who is just to her left, all right, um, unseemingly become friends. And that happens uh, as the case is Ricky Fairley uh, is actually the son of a Dartmouth College alum, Richard Fairley, uh, who was the class of 1955. And so they routinely would come up every winter for the winter carnival weekends that are hosted uh, at the college, which we still have to this day. And so she was accustomed to being on campus and kind of being around Dartmouth and growing up kind of really had this affinity and, and connection with Dartmouth. And so she recounts telling her dad that, hey, I wanna go to Dartmouth College. Like this is the place I wanna go to. And he actually kind of chuckles and remarks to her that it, you know it's a men's it's a man's school you can't you can't go to Dartmouth right men aren't allowed I mean women aren't allowed and so ironically enough it will be several years later as she grows up they start accepting women and so she applies and is admitted in 1974 and so she comes to Dartmouth with her mom and dad and sister and they're, you know, ready to move in and set up and say her long goodbyes. And she tells the story of how she met Victoria as they were driving and, um, you know, saying their goodbyes and talking about what college would be like. And her, they're, they're driving down the street and they see this young black woman walking down the street. And uh, her dad out of nowhere just stops the car and yells out the window, hey, you, little girl get in the car and uh <laughs> in true fashion she's shocked and she walks over and she gets in the car uh and he asks her you know what's your name and she says uh, victoria stewart and he says well this is my daughter ricky and you guys are going to be friends and then kind of like that was that um and so that was how they initially met uh ricky fairly goes on to say that they actually didn't kind of talk or hang out much for several weeks. And it wasn't until they had a cheerleading uh, tryouts happening several weeks later that they ran into each other again. And it was like, oh, hey, like, I remember you. You you know, you were the one with the crazy dad who flagged me down, made me get in the car and um, kind of welcomed me and introduced me and everything. And so that's kind of where their friendship really sparks up from there. Um, Vic, Vicky, as she's known, uh, Vicky Stewart was from Chattanooga, Tennessee. And so Ricky fairly talks a lot about how they, in the early days, she was really helping her acclimate to the cold temperature. You know, she wasn't used to a Hanover winter, much like we're seeing today. Um, and so sharing sweaters and giving her coats that her grandmother had sent and um, just really developing this really tight knit bond and, and the sense of community 
amongst them. And um, she really says that, you know, navigating a time when you're a, one of the first waves of women to be let in at this institution, as well as Black, on top of that being Black, so now you're kind of compounding that otherness that you feel uh, at the school. It was her relationship with, she says cheerleading, but more, but more centrally, Vicki Stewart and that bond that they had that really helped her to navigate and, and, and persevere through a lot of the challenges that she faced while at Dartmouth. And uh, both of them graduated in 1978, being the class, I believe, of, uh, with the first Black women graduating from Dartmouth and um, now have gone on to be legacies as they both have children who also have come to Dartmouth, uh, both have uh, daughters who have graduated and kind of continued that legacy. And so I, I loved hearing and reading about not just that trailblazing act, but kind of the kinship and the bond um, that I really think about and reflect about when I think about Black community um, and how that is a key part of um, resilience and perseverance. And then last but not least, uh, just to show that again, trailblazing and pioneering is not a distant past thing, but is still ever, ever present. Um, this is Miss Monique Walters. And some of you may actually know her. I had the pleasure of meeting her while she was here as well. And um, incredibly uh, intelligent and dynamic and also super personable and chill grounded person. Um, and she grad she's class of 2019. Um, but in 2018 was uh, voted as the first black female student assembly president in the entire 250 year history of the, of the college. And she won by huge margins, huge margins. And um, she made it a point to kind of champion initiatives in, in mental health and sexual assault and really made it a point to have a lasting impact as a lot of the clubs that she started and initiatives and, and policies that she was uh, kind of a fervent supporter of. And in a lot of cases, um, the uh, originator of a lot of those policies are, are still to this day um, used to help, again, broaden that umbrella and really, really uh, help to bring this idea of equity to uh, the forefront of the college. Um, she graduated, as I said, in 2019. She lives and works in, in New York City right now. And I just thought it was uh, super powerful to see that when she was uh, voted student assembly president, uh, there was an article done in, in the news, in, in the paper. And um, she had this quote where she said, it definitely was a surprise because honestly, I wasn't sure if the campus was ready to have a black woman as the face of the student body. And so I thought that was a perfect um, kind of wrap up a culminating piece to uh, this presentation. And again, bringing us right up to the modern day. <laughs>